Okay, I want to thank everybody for joining us today for our Q1 of 2022 Tech Talk on this illustrious January 27th, as Aaron so calmly put it as, what the hell is going on with January? Um, with me today is Francois and Aaron. What we're going to do is basically take a look at a little bit of historical, where we've been, where we're going, not just with API protocols, which was what we talked about, but also why we're actually bringing this up. And with that, let me just jump right in. With sincere apologies to Lennon and McCartney, it was 20 years ago, not quite today, but close enough in the great scheme of things, that Layer 7 Technologies was actually founded by, and this is where Franco can jump in and say, no, that's not how you pronounce it, uh, Tufek Bubez. Jamie Glennon, Lonnie McLean, and Dimitri Sorota. Um, and the whole idea of Layer 7, and there's a reason I bring this up, because we are talking about API Academy, but the whole idea of Layer 7 back then was bringing governance to SOA. At the end of the day, it was all about security. And we provided a very unique blend of XML combined with security, combined with SOA capabilities. And due to our architecture, as the world migrated away from SOA back or over to API management, it was a very easy transition for us. And one of the big things we provided was innovation in addition to SOA and security. It was innovation around OAuth and later on OpenID Connect. ID Connect. Um, over the next 10 years, Layer 7 picked up tons of awards, including Deloitte's Technology Pass 500, the Cody Awards, Technology Fast 50, the British Columbia Technology Innovation Awards, that's a mouthful, 2013, Stevie's 2010 On Demand, Top 100, InfoWorld 100, Gardner Cool Vendor, and then that's where we started to rack up leadership in um, rankings in the MQ, the Way, the Leadership Compass from KC, the Decision Matrix, et cetera. Now, the reason I bring up Layer 7 is 10 years later, so 10 years ago today, relatively speaking, API Academy was founded by Layer 7, and the whole idea of that was basically APIs were fairly new to the enterprise world, and the enterprise needed a way to actually understand the value of API design strategy and security when it comes to implementation. So they brought in Matt McClarty, who brought, who set up an absolutely, and I don't think anybody will deny this, an absolutely killer API Academy team. And it was and is the first and only industry agnostic site for world-class API design, strategy, and security concepts and best practices. In 2020, we rolled out our first and only vendor agnostic certification program for API designer, API security architect, and API product manager. Now in 2013, Layer 7 and API Academy were, 2013, that's a 2018, sorry about that. Or no, it's 2013. It was acquired by CA Technologies with tons of worldwide growth. That's the big thing that CA brought to Layer 7 is that breadth of focus around the world. Um, and we continue to demonstrate leadership in the MQ, the Wave Decision Matrix, and Leadership Compass. In other words, you couldn't go wrong throughout the um, throughout the 20s uh, by going with Layer 7. 2014 to 2018, that's when we really started to bring in awards, best in API infrastructure and security. API security came in over and over and over for reasons I've already discussed. And then in 2018, we were acquired by Broadcom, uh, both Layer 7 and API Academy, with a high focus innovation based on customer input. And we'll talk more about that at the end, but cabs, office hours, et cetera, we really talk to our customers to determine what they need, uh, what they want, and from an API, academy perspective, um, what kind of education they need. Uh, Broadcom has continued support for API Academy, and given that this, this is a lost leader, that's rather impressive for Broadcom. And we continue to work with industry partners to make enterprises safer, more efficient, and more profitable with less risk. So looking back at API Academy over the last 10 years, literally, we wrote the book on best practices for API design, strategy, and security, as well as microservices. These are all available either on O'Reilly or on API Academy. Highly recommend taking a look if you haven't seen these before. And with that, what I'm going to do is stop sharing and turn it over to Aaron. There we go. To kind of talk about, okay, that's what we've done for 20 years. Um, from your perspective, Excuse me. Um, or actually, Franco, 
what is it, you know, going back 20 years, what is it that uh, caused you to originally become an interested in service orientation and essentially come over to uh, layer seven? Hey, Bill. And uh, yeah, hello, API Academy. So yeah, 20 years ago, and thanks for the nod to layer seven there. You know, the, if, if I think about service orientation, you know, for me, it kind of, started three years before that actually right um in 1999 you know i was working at a time for uh a, a startup that is a company that's still alive today uh it's called tom tom they do a lot of uh, uh car navigation stuff um but at the time you know we were looking for a way to decompose uh, a server-side application right uh and i remember in, in 1999 i was you know i had a couple books uh that was uh that in my stack of books there i was reading about decom and i was reading about corba the microsoft way versus the corba way and you know it uh it it wasn't really easy right uh and i was much younger obviously back then in 1999 but somebody came up at the office in amsterdam and said hey this somebody came up with this this early thing called so basically we're going to send text over HTTP and, and there's going to be a web server and, and you're just going to get that context and you can format whatever objects uh, in that text and it completely decouples, you know, the color of the service. And they're like, whoa, that was mind blown, right? Because that was a game changer. It made everything just, we just ran from there. Uh, so yeah, I mean, three years later, Layer seven, you know, uh, XML was a much more defined thing. Web services were standardizing. People were starting to adopt it. So, you know, that's that's how things got uh, started. But I want to bring Aaron to the conversation because I'm I'm curious about him, right? We're talking about 20 years ago, and and I don't even know if he was born 20 years ago. So, Aaron, uh, what about you? What was that like? You know, I was a I was a father 20 years ago. I actually looked this up when I uh, when I realized that we were 20 years from the layer seven startup. I looked up some interesting things. One of the things I I noticed or found was the average web page from a user's home took 16 seconds to load. Right, that that's probably why we weren't doing APIs and web services and things like that. But yeah, 16 seconds to load. The average song took seven seven to 10 minutes to download, right? So it was a different age. Um, I was working at IBM uh, where I was in the web sphere integration space. So the things like SOA was starting to pick up, but it was a lot of messaging and message brokers and hey, there's this world of spaghetti and we're gonna try and simplify that with an ESB um, and and multiple protocols, right? The ESB was all about connectors and things like AS2. I remember we, just before I, I left, we bought Sterling Software, which is all around managed file transfer. So it really was maybe not the Wild West, but the pretty Wild West, right? In, in ways that things talk to each other, services and applications. Um, we bought a XML firewall company uh, while I was at IBM. And that was really the first move, I think, to to seeing at least some sort of standard in the the message format, right? ESBs were taking a message, it was in you know some crazy format for banking and it needed to go to some crazy format for for the industry. And I think ESBs started to have you know XML internally, right? For things moving around. I think that was a good move and it was a key move and we saw that move on, right? Yeah, I mean you're you're talking about XML, right? For, for you know, back to my Eureka moment, we're, we're actually sending text over HTTP, uh, uh, and, but you add XML, you overlap XML on top of that. And, you know, that really gets to the meat of the API because, you know, you, you can structure data in, in a very, uh, you know, in an easy way to parse and, and, and uh, render again. Uh, yeah. But now it's, it's crazy because now they, I look at XML and I cringe. So, you know, tell me more. It was great XML. though, right? XML was great. I mean, I'd mucked around with a few things. I knew, you know, I, I worked in the J2E space. Um, so, you know, I'd seen web applications and XML for me, I'm kind of a rules guy, right? So XML was 
like, well, I've got HTML, but I don't finish these tags off, right? I, why do I not finish those off? So XML kind of, like you said, it helped me define things and see things really clearly. Um, I think it is kind of readable as well, right? It's not a binary format. It's something that you're not going to want to read a book in it, but at least you can work out what's going on. But there were a lot of, you know, there were a lot of issues with it, right? It was it was heavy. The the vendor that IBM bought as an XML gateway had specific hardware to help us parse the XML faster. I think things grew on it, right? We have things like XML schema. You know, I think of what we have today when we, you know, if I want to go and use an API that's out there, I can go and learn about that really quickly. I remember going on site to our customers and, or well, how the heck does this thing talk to this thing? If I was lucky, I had an XML schema. If I wasn't, I just had an XML message and had to work from that. But things like XSLT, XPath, I think they made our life easier and easier. And I think, you know, that that was a good thing. But then suddenly, bang, we XML is no longer the friendly thing. We we want to use something different. And I think, you know, Jason came along. In my mind, Jason came along pretty quickly. It it seemed to be bang, the popular thing. And it there was definitely some confusion at that point. I remember speaking to lots of customers saying, we want to do a REST API, Aaron. Really, what they were doing was a JSON API. They had no idea about, you know, Fielding's um, dissertation on REST and, and those kinds of things. But JSON is human readable, apparently. That's what, you know, one of the taglines we have with it. I, I don't think I'd give that to my wife or kids to read. It's it's more readable maybe than than XML, but um, and it's got a lot of benefits, right? It's it's easier for us to to process. It's easier for us to um, parse computationally it's cheaper but we've gone through the same cycle with it right we we started with json it was fairly free form now we have json schema we have json path uh, and i think we're starting to put those those kinds of things into place but um yeah i think there are there are plenty of other protocols out there but i think it, we've really gone full circle on that um and we spent a lot of time transforming protocols right i mean Lots of people didn't want to reinvest in JSON because maybe it wasn't the next thing. So we did XML to JSON transformations and we did those in languages that, you know, was always tilted one way. It was JavaScript for the JSON guys. It was XLT. But, you know, there are a lot of other protocols out there and, um, and message formats. I think some of the binary ones are really interesting. So, you know, do, do you see those are still valid? Do you, do you think some of the ones we are interested in? Yeah, yeah. I get Text over HTTP, you know, there's it's a big umbrella, right? You talked about XML and JSON, and, and you can put yeah. QL in there, and, and it, it's all under that umbrella, right? But what about stuff that falls outside of that, right? So, um, you know, there's HTTP protocol itself, but there, there's also like what is even even if you stay over HTTP or 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 something similar, right? You've got text-based protocols versus binary protocols, right? So, it, you know, an uh, an ancient version of that, but back to our history, right? There was the Java, the Java version of it was RMI, Microsoft had a version of it, right? So it's more formal. You need code on both sides to use that. Today, there's uh, gRPC and Protobuf, which is kind of like a modern version of that. Um, and I think that, you know, that there's a pendulum uh, a little bit that swings between, you know, the popularity of text-based versus binary protocols. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and and if you think about, you know, what you need today and for the future is you need um, extensibility, right? You need to be able to bring those things together. Like you talked about XML to JSON, the same thing applies to, um, you know, binary protocols or, or transport protocols, right? Because uh, HTTP is not the only thing. Uh, it's been prevalent for years. It's been something that's allowed this whole thing to get momentum and grow to what it is today. But there's so many other transport protocols, right? Yeah, but HTTP has been the consistent one, right? I mean, even before we were talking about SOAP, yeah, your Eureka moment, we were using HTTP for a number of things, but it, it's been there throughout this journey, right? HTTP, I've, I've used it every day of my life since, since 20 years ago. And, um, you know, SOAP was interesting. You know, everything was post, right? <laughs> there was no HTTP GET. It was all, you know, I send you a message, you send me something back. Um, 
And REST built on that, right? REST did a great job of taking, well, we've got these verbs. Why don't we use those? It exploited those. It probably drove HTTP to evolve in, in lots of ways. Yeah, but the reason it was so it was so good, is still so good, is because it's built on things everybody knew, right? The web server model had been proven. Mm -hmm. The developers were used to writing code to do HTTP gets. So they suddenly turned themselves into a web page developer, into an API developer, or, you know, most importantly, an app developer. That's where we really, you know, we we drew this on. And I think things like GraphQL are not trying to be too clever. I think the reason that the core protocols have stayed really successful and the other ones have kind of moved in and out is that they've relied on HTTP2. Mm -hmm. And I was looking, I can't remember the HTTP 1.1, you know, it's been out a heck of a long time. Right? Yes. It's, me and you have been working with that ever since we worked together. Mm -hmm. HTTP2, I don't know. I don't feel the love. I don't feel the traction in the industry. You know, we've supported that in our product for quite a while, but people are, are, are not necessarily adopting that quite as quickly as maybe we thought or we hoped. And it's, you know, it, it's faster. It's more reliable. It's got server mm -hmm. push capability. It's got newer TLS methods and, and security, but I don't know. Do you think it's doing too much? Do you think it's trying to do all the things that other non HTTP protocols are doing, and that's why we don't need it? Or yeah, I mean, like you said, HTTP one one was there for so long that you know people didn't wait for HTTP to evolve to go beyond what HTTP was doing, right? So if you think about messaging protocols, right, that that's there's nothing new there. Back twenty years ago, we we were doing you know let's say Web Sphere MQ or JMS or something like that, right, and and. And today you would do, you'd be doing Kafka and and, and other uh, transport protocols that are message based, right? So uh, I think HTTP two. One of the reasons it's you're, you're not seeing you know um, HTTP two replacing all the existing HTTP one is that HTTP one is good enough for what is being used right now, and in many cases, right? And uh, uh, I think that that's one of the reasons. Um, but if we think about what you need for the future, the same thing applies when we talk about mediation uh, of the message level, mediation of the transport level is massive. That's a, that's a pattern that has uh, some staying power, right? We, we were doing that 20 years ago. For example, in the context of transport, you pull a message from MQ, you call a web service or the other way around, right? You call a REST service and you drop something on a queue. Uh, today, the same thing happens, right? Maybe a GraphQL comes in, you drop something on the Kafka uh, topic, right? So these, the ability to, to, to be able to switch and, and to orchestrate these different, uh, uh, you know, interactions between the different systems is, is, is basically what you need. You need to be flexible and you need to be able to plug these things together. Yeah, absolutely. You need to, you need to be able to build your application and, and go with the times, right? And if something new comes out, we need to be able to switch to that and use it and exploit it. And I think, you know, like you said, MQ, I mean, when I worked at IBM, MQ never went outside the network, right? But there are messaging protocols now that meet those requirements and are more lightweight and, and make a lot of sense in that. So, yeah, I think that mixture is good. Okay. So early on, you were saying, you know, that it's, it was all about security, right? And, and it continues to be a lot about what we're doing is about security. So what about security, Aaron, right? Because when you think about APIs, there's a lot of protocols around APIs that relate to security. So uh, let's talk about this maybe. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of joined the, the layer seven space, if you like, 15 years ago, and then I joined layer seven uh, 11 years ago. And at the time, the time, you know, web services were really building up that one of the comments that really stuck in my mind was from a Microsoft executive that said web services or SOAP is firewall friendly. And what he meant was you can open a hole in your firewall and just throw what you want through it and what comes back. And that was maybe OK in in those very early days. And maybe things like basic auth were enough to protect that. I remember talking to a customer in the UK and I'm not going to read the name out. I asked them about what they were doing for their security of their of their service, right? Their API, and they said, "Well, we're nothing." I said, "Well, how do you expect it to be safe?" They said, "Well, we're not telling anyone about it, Aaron." Yeah. I was like, "Oh, that's okay, right. well, that's fine. No one will find it." And and yeah, like twenty years ago, maybe that was okay. But now with 
you know, APIs running on mobile phones, calling to services all over the world. Everyone's aware of everything. And, you know, some of the hacks we've seen of, you know, cars and home I IoT devices and all that kind of thing, kind of bring that forward. So, yeah, I think it was, again, it's one of these things we've gone through. I think we've ended up in right now in a re relatively good place, but, oh my goodness, XML security, XML signatures. I mean, they they were, they were heavy, they were heavy to process, they were massively brittle, right? And we took that technology and we moved it into SOAP and said, okay, well, instead of an XML SOAP signature, we'll have a SOAP WS security. That was an interrupt and, nightmare, right? Oh, it was, a, yeah. Every, and, and everyone, like you said, everyone did it different. The Java world and the Microsoft world were always slightly different. There were things like WS Secure Conversation and, you know, yeah. and Zachamel and that kind of stuff. And it was heavy. And, you know, thankfully, I think the the mobile app world explosion helped us out because we had to solve some of those things. And Jason helped, but I think there are a number of other things. And you and I worked on some of the really early auth stuff, right? That was that was really interesting. That's right. There, there was always a you know tug and pull between you know the enterprise side of things and and the more grassroots uh, uh, web you know initiatives uh that were coming out at the time so people start you know saying oh let's use api just api keys right here's an api key and don't tell anyone about your api key because that's a shared secret and just show it's it to embedded you in, it in the app it's safe right yeah yeah so obviously you know there have been a lot of people getting hurt with that uh from an api security perspective um, you know, API keys uh, leaking, you know, they end up on, on public GitHub repos is a classic one, right? Or they end up in logs or, or you know, even like in, in, in a web page, you know, you look at the source code of a web page and an API key might be there, right? So, so they're extremely insecure. A lot of people got hurt with that. OAuth um, was a great way to have more, you know, ephemeral uh, sessions and, but OAuth, when it started, was also had its own complexity, right? It, it was refreshing from the kind of stuff you were talking about. But OAuth started with signatures, um, and the way that you would calculate these signatures was also, you know, maybe a little bit of friction that uh, uh, that was in the way, and so quickly that moved away. And and but if you think about what about today, right? Um, because there you, you will encounter APIs that have um, you know, a variety of different uh, security mechanisms, right? So you kind of need to be prepared to, 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 to continue to support some of these things, but you also need, you know, to do things the way that you do it now with JWT tokens and claims and JWT tokens. You need to be able to mediate between a JWT token maybe that you're using internally, that you're passing into your microservice or your service mesh layer, and, and maybe on the outside, you need to mediate with a, an opaque token, right? So you need to be able to connect to, um, the identity where it is, and and that implies things like strong authentication, right? Uh, 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 back channel authentication, you know, modern OAuth protocols like SIBA, uh, defining authorization in uh, OPA. Uh, you know, those are the type of things that you you want to be able to support and. You know, it is hard to do API security. It requ it typically requires to integrate a lot of different uh, moving parts. Um, but yeah, it's a beautiful thing when it works. There's a lot of legacy stuff as well, right? It's it's not it's not all the the new modern great world of OAuth and OpenID and Jot. It, you know, there's a lot of integration still to go on there. So yeah. Okay. So what about um? What about the way we describe APIs? I mean, that's changed a lot, right? Yeah, API description. Yeah, what about API description? That's a good question. So it was very different back then, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it was, that, that I will use the term Wild West, right? That, then it was, you know, how do I share my API with the world? Mm. It was, anything from you know an email with a url and the and a key in it or maybe not even a key to a, a uddi directory which I, I think a uddi directory is probably wasted more project time and project resources than anything else you know they were you know if you read 
if you read the kind of idealism about UDDI directory, it was, oh, there'll be almost like one or two in the world and everyone will register and you'll be able to find their APIs. And yeah. you know, we found that, no, they're internal things and they were very much IT led and governance led. Yeah. Yeah. They were, you know, they ended up becoming, I, I believe they ended up just becoming basically a registry and the kind of audit and control parts of them kind of fell away. They weren't often implemented properly. And then, you know, the services were defined in WSDLs and that kind of stuff. And now we've, we've moved on, but we still have a similar story, right? We have a developer portal and the APIs are defined by Swagger, and that's probably all much nicer. I think the difference for me is um, the portal idea, the developer portal idea is more designed at the consumer. And by the consumer, I mean the poor, the poor person, the poor developer that's going to consume your API. It's more defined. We've really opened up the world of APIs to say, OK, I can't develop everything I need. You come and use the API. You get the most out of it. And that's that's really the difference for me between UDDI and the portal is UDDI was all about control. And that's right. uh, but we've still got the whole, you know, internal, external thing. Right. Yeah. You know, as, as API um, evangelists, specialists every day, we see that a large majority of people's APIs are still internal and, and those portals are internal. But yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of things in there that we can we can see repeated, but I think we have learned it's definitely an easier world. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of um, you know, if you think about the contracts that are formal versus contracts that uh, focus on the actual de developer experience, right? Mm -hmm. Let's focus on the developer experience. That's what Portals is about, right? Back in the UDDI days, we weren't talking about, you know, the developer experience. Um, so I think that that is at least as important as things like standards like OpenAPI or Async API. Just focus on the developer experience, um, you know, and, uh, there's always uh, go for the easiest way to, to to describe your API. Yeah. All right. So I guess uh, you know we've chatted for half an hour. Um, if anybody does have questions, they can put them in the chat window. Um, we'll you know we'll be around for a while if you want to ask us questions or if you have any you know comments or just your your perspective on anything we've talked about. Um, I guess you know in a in a way to kind of wrap up our conversation Francois are there you know are there anything you think that people have uh, have done over the years are there patterns that can that we've learned from that can help the, our customers and you know API uh, builders consumers going forward do you think there's things we you know we should definitely continue to do things we can change that sort of thing yeah some some uh, lasting patterns right ways that we see people have been successful over the years and these projects surviving decades and continue to thrive right so integrate your way into the optimal user experience i think that's the last point you were saying uh, we were talking about earlier right through integration you create the experience that you need to create um to survive in a heterogeneous environment right because you go through modernization phase you end up with more legacy stuff, more modern stuff, you have acquisitions, you have a whole bunch of different stacks, right? So because of that heterogeneity, you need mediation of protocols. Uh, you need to be able to orchestrate, you know, pick up events from this side and put it there. You need general integration and, and APIs are crucial. That's why internal APIs are such a, a huge uh, part of what uh, people use us for, right? Uh, and yeah, with the APIs comes the security that, that, that's required to avoid problems, right? You you don't want um, to be the one that leaks an API key and not have the right precautions in place to, you know, get breached or something like that. So API security uh, is uh, not a simple thing, but it's extremely important. It's a big challenge. So I think we talked enough, uh, Bill. What do you think? Bill, you're muted. You're mute. yeah, I'm still learning how to use a computer. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. I, I like your last point. I it's it's one of, I have uh, several security decks, and one of my points that I always try to make is nobody wants to be the guy responsible for your name being in the paper. 
from an API breach perspective. So uh, very valid point. Um, so as we start to wrap up here, we we definitely have time for Q and A, but um, I wanted to summarize with a few things. First of all, um, thanks guys for taking the time out of your day to uh, you know, the audience for listening to us for for uh, Francois and Aaron to actually take time and reminisce about the last 20 years and where we're going. Um, again, thanks for attending our next API Academy Tech Talk. We're targeting the middle of April of, ne of, of this year, obviously. Um, and we're looking at API attack vectors, including outside the API management infrastructure. In other words, what happens if somebody is trying to, you know that your layer seven gateway is pretty impenetrable. What about if somebody tries to bypass it? So should be fairly interesting. Um, we have marked a CTO of a fairly large security organization that's going to be chatting about that. On the layer seven front, office hours continues to be the third Thursday of each month. Um, to stay on top of scheduling, you can either follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn or go to the layer seven communities where we stay on top of that with announcements as well as bulletins. And it's also where you will find um, any previous month's um, office hours. And if you want to go hut and peck, and I haven't tried this, but I know that it's there. There is a corporate calendar now for BSG software that uh, you can use as another avenue to stay on top of scheduling. And you've heard it here first. This is hot off the press. Uh, new blogs continue to be posted on API Academy. We have uh, the following in the queue, which is some of these are kind of interesting. Data exchange method for APIs, API reliability um, with SREs. Key use cases for GraphQL APIs, um, continuous API management for cloud architecture, anti-patterns in microservices. I like this. Don't do these. Um, continuous API documentation relating to continuous API management. And finally, solving governance for continuous API management. And with that, I'm going to get that off the screen and um, basically turn it over to Q and A. You know, I've gone back on mute or nobody's talking. Yep, looks like we're looks like we're there, Bill. Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close this up. I really do appreciate, as I've said before, uh, both participation with the API Academy team as well as the audience. And we look forward to seeing you again in April. Stay on top of API Academy um, website or follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or in the case of API Academy, also Facebook to uh, see exactly when the next API Academy, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Tech Talks is. And with